All right, this is going to meet, be the Meet the VC panel. Uh, FYI, there are two mics there, so if you have any questions when it's Q&A by direction here, please go to one of the mics. Okay, cool. Just give me a big hand. Cool. So my name is John Herring. I work at a company called Lookout. Um, you know, the company Lookout, for those who don't know, does mobile security. We actually started here at DEF CON and after a number of years of, of doing research and spending time here in the community, we were able to actually build a business and ended up raising venture capital. So I thought it might be interesting to share some of our stories and uh, spend some time getting to know some of the top venture capitalists who work in the security industry as well. So maybe we can introduce ourselves starting with you, JJ. Hello. Uh, my name is John Jack. I go by JJ. Clever. Um, I was the CEO of a security company called Fortify Software, uh, which was um, security at the application level. We were one of the pioneers in that space, at least in terms of uh, commercializing a lot of work that had been done uh, prior to us starting the company. Um, uh, we grew that company fairly well, became the standard in uh, financial institutions, governments, telcos, and actually the standard in um, commercial software providers, uh, people like Oracle and SAP and EMC all used uh, this product in order to uh, root out vulnerabilities in the software that they delivered to their customers. Uh, that company was acquired by Hewlett Packard in uh, 2010. Um, previous to that I was CEO of a couple other companies, uh, one we sold to VMware, one we sold to a company called Corporate Data. Um, uh, and now I work uh, part time with a VC firm called Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, we have a number of investments in security. Um, and I also uh, part time do some consulting and, and serve as an independent director on other venture backed uh, companies. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matt Ocko. I very unglamorously go by Matt. Um, <clears throat> I'm the co-founder and uh, co-managing partner of a firm called Data Collective. We like doing deep, dark, difficult stuff that uh, most of our venture colleagues, ironically except for the guys on this panel, uh, disdain or don't understand. It's where we've made most of our money. Uh, it seems to be a reasonable thesis uh, across 220 companies over nearly 25 years. We've had fewer than 20 losses and we've made our entrepreneurs about $30 billion net of boom, bust, uh, IRS, you name it. Uh, I think uh, some of the distinguishing characteristics of, of our firm that may be a little unusual is that uh, three out of the four partners still read and write code, um, still understand chip design. Uh, if you show me a 10 million gate design and you're lying to me about the clock tree, I will know. Uh, and uh, we've uh, really enjoyed doing really fundamental stuff. We're the seed investors in ZenSource. We're very early on in VeriSign. A number of our companies in the security space are important parts of Google and VMware and, and Facebook and some other demanding customers around the world. And we love this stuff and I'm very happy to be here today. Good afternoon. My name is Ping Lee. I'm a partner at Excel. Uh, I've been doing venture investing for close to 10 years now. Excel is a early stage venture capital firm. We've backed uh, companies all the way from the C stage to the growth stage. Uh, offices here in the, the U.S., Silicon Valley, uh, in London, China, and India. And our, our goal is to always find exciting entrepreneurs are trying to build category defining companies and been investing in security for quite some time and look out uh, is, is just one, one of many companies we work with. Hi, I'm Deepak Jeevan Kumar from uh, General Catalyst Partners. Okay. We are an early stage and late stage venture capital firm with uh, $2.5 billion under management and we have bagged companies across multiple industries including cybersecurity. Some of our investments that you know of are Kayak, Airbnb, Stripe, Snapchat more recently. Uh, and uh, we have also I uh, have not shied away from uh, hard technology investments. So actually uh, Axel and I used to share an investment called BBN Technologies where, where the early internet research was done. And uh, one of our companies called Reveal Imaging did like a hard hardware for bomb scanners and they had only one customer called the TSA. 
So uh, personally, I uh, started writing code when I was about seven or eight years old. I don't remember now. And uh, the first one was Logo. I don't know if you, if you guys ever used Logo before. And uh, I have uh, hacked quite a bit. And I think uh, I was lucky to be involved in two of the largest supercomputing projects. I was an architect on those projects in, in human history. Uh, so happy to share and uh, happy to. Uh, I hope we can convince more of you to become entrepreneurs in cybersecurity. So, so it's interesting. So, so this is my 11th year at DEF CON and I can tell you when I first started coming it's not a, something I would have expected to see venture capitalists at DEF CON and it, it's definitely changed a lot as time has gone on. Just the interest from a mainstream capacity in cybersecurity in general has changed a lot as, as this technology has touched the fabric of society and uh, people's everyday lives. I'm, I'm curious, what are you guys looking for? I'm, uh, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are curious, you know, as they're building projects and whatnot, you know, what is it going to take to get funded by a venture capitalist? What are the types of things that you look for when you're looking for, you know, a security investment, you know, looking for people at a conference like this? Okay. We're, we're still going in reverse order because it says number four here. Um, so uh, I, I, I would not, I won't address the technical side of it because my background I think you could tell from the introduction is not, I'm not a super, uh, I'm not a hacker despite the shirt that I proudly wear. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, I, I, would, I would say two things in terms of what, what, a, what do we look for in a security investment. I mean the, f the first is obviously we look for something that has a, a wide applicability so that the market opportunity is big. And if you take a, if you think about how you can leverage a large market opportunity, one of the key things is are you leveraging something beyond just a security solution? So a lot of security solutions are frankly point solutions to address a tough problem in security and you can make some nice companies out of that. But if you're also leveraging another major trend, so for example, enterprises moving to the cloud and cloud-based applications. So one of the investments we made at Andreessen Horowitz uh, in which I'm on the board is called Cypher Cloud. And what Cypher Cloud does is essentially allow people who use Salesforce and, and uh, Office 365 and Gmail and Box and other cloud-based applications, it allows them to secure the data that's in the cloud such that if a government organization cites the Patriot Act and says to Salesforce give us all the data for XYZ company, the data is encrypted. It won't, it won't be meaningful. So it's therefore protected. And when you're in a heavy regulated industry, that's something you need to address. So there's a company that not only has solved a security issue but is also leveraging a, a broader trend in technology which is people moving workloads from on-premise into the cloud in one form or another. So that's an example of, of looking at an opportunity that might be bigger than just um, a, 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 a purpose-built specific solution to a, a security problem. Um, and the other thing I would say is that we, we look for really smart entrepreneurs that, that, that are super motivated, that really have uh, a lot of drive, a lot of ambition and really want to be successful. And, uh, um, and so when you put those two together, you, you have kind of a winning formula. So I, I, I think uh, John makes an excellent point. Big, big markets are important uh, but in a number of the investments that we've done, some of which actually uh, ended up being co-investments with um, uh, Ping's team at Excel or, or John's team at Andreessen as, um, uh, as they went through the end of their seed stage or, or into later stages uh, are distinguished by not addressing a big market today. So, um, you know, half the Fortune 500 runs uh, or more than half the 500, 90% of the Fortune 500, 95% runs these Potemkin Village um, antivirus systems. That's a, that's a big market. You can say, hey, 10 bucks on uh, every aging desktop PC for the U.S. and, and other G7 countries is a big market. We have no interest in that. We're interested in the stuff that's going to cause a CIO or a CSO to, uh, uh, in, in a late stage adopter company three years from now, 
to panic and say, I must have this at all costs. Because one of the, one of the dark but unspoken truisms in venture capital is anything worth doing actually takes a long time. Uh, and all these sort of uh, huge fantasy outcomes that are celebrated as overnight successes uh, or inevitable successes uh, like a, a, a Google um, actually took seven or eight years of, of really hard work. Um, things like Nasira, uh, and congratulations to Andreessen for having the foresight to invest in that, are, are kind of random events. So when you're building a product, if it's doing something meaningful, by the time you've got it polished and by the time somebody that's going to pay you actually gives a crap, it's been a couple years, maybe more. So if you're looking at stuff that will motivate a customer today, you've already put yourself out of the running. Uh, so to do that, to John's point, takes incredible intestinal fortitude. It takes people who can solve difficult multi-dimensional problems about how to run their company and keep their team happy um, and, uh, and keep their customers happy all at the same time on limited amounts of money. Uh, and because you're going for the gusto for something in the future, it takes incredible tech jobs. So, I mean, everybody on this panel is motivated not to invest in Me Too tech, even if it's looking three years out or something undifferentiated. Um, we want to see stuff that has sustainable competitive advantage. Uh, and so two, two interesting examples. Um, uh, we're in a, a, a company called Sentinel um, uh, that, that we did with, uh, uh, with Ping's crew at Excel. Um, uh, those guys are standing a lot of uh, existing security assumptions uh, on its head. They're doing something very, very interesting that actually produces deterministic results for important stuff and runs only in user space. They don't hook the kernel at all. Uh, I was astonished. I didn't believe it. Um, it took me a long time to understand it. Uh, but it's light years ahead of anything else out there. That was worth doing. Uh, we're in a company with, uh, with John and his team at A16Z called Illumio that's doing things that people said was impossible um, to uh, enforce security for fungible workloads uh, in the cloud. And, uh, and by the way, John, I think it's fair to say that when those guys started doing that, most people were disdainful that real corporate compute workloads would move to the cloud. So anyway, hope, hope that's useful. Yeah, I, the, the, the one point I would echo that Matt just said is some of these security markets that become really large are not obvious at first. Um, and trying to, the great entrepreneurs are the ones that kind of see around the corner. And I, I remember when we first invested in, in John's company, John Herring's company, uh, years ago around mobile security, the Android phone didn't really exist. The iPhone was just shipping. It wasn't obvious there was going to be any security problems with the mobile phone at the time. And, uh, you know, having that foresight to be that far ahead of the market and understanding where the hackers are going to be, I think is, 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 a, is a real set of instincts that we look for. Security is particularly hard to invest in because it's an arms race. Every time someone comes to our office with a great idea, there's 10 hackers out there with a better idea that's going to get around his great idea. So you really have to find entrepreneurs that we found that really have been coming to DevCon for the last X number of years. They have to be in the cutting edge of whatever the hacker community is thinking about and pushing the envelope on. And that's really hard to find. You know, folks that actually understand the problem but also understand the opportunity to build a company around, uh, that intersection is, is really rare and that's kind of what we look for in security. Yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, most of those points. One thing that I would like to add is that uh, we are at the intersection of you know, three major trends at the same time in the history of computer science and technology, mobile, cloud computing, and big data. A lot of people have written about this. But what that means is that we are going to see multi-dimensional security problems that we've never seen before. So it is an amazingly good time to be, start, to be thinking about innovations in cybersecurity. I actually wrote an article yesterday on the Forbes on um, cybersecurity for the app economy. And, but the point I make is that we have to make tools that are faster and more better than things that we have seen before because of this multidimensional problem that, that exists today. And in terms of the entrepreneurs that we look after specifically, um, number one, 
you need to be great evangelists of your product without overselling it. Then number two is you, you should have the ability to look around market changes because markets do change. Human behavior changes very rapidly than what we think it, it does. Then, and to Ping's point, yeah, you need to be best of breed in what you do. And you need to stand the test of your uh, peer groups uh, who are almost as good as you or even better than you. John, uh, if I might, I, I guess broadly speaking, me, everybody in this audience uh, is kind of in the catbird seat for building a company because as much as fluffy consumer companies get love and attention and, um, and big valuations, that's actually not where the real money is. And every, everybody in this room is probably aware of somewhere between a, a mini to a full-scale security holocaust that's in process. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty convinced that RSA up to 512 bits is irretrievably broken which means every bank and web server and DNS cert out there is effectively vulnerable right now. I'd say that's a pretty large problem. And the only alternative, um, you know, I mean, there are alternatives. The only practical one is stuck rotting away inside of RIM. So there's a giant $10 billion company right there that I don't see anybody doing right now. Um, you know, uh, people are fantasizing about the so-called Internet of Things. I can't even leave my Bluetooth on here because I would pre really prefer not to pay for your guys' next vacation. Um, and so, uh, so everything from my future pacemaker to uh, the electric meter on my house to the thing that orders food for my kids in my refrigerator cir circa 2020 is going to be produced by the same ass clowns that can't even have effective security on my phone. So, I, I mean, John asked a really good question. What are we looking for? Well, the, the, the answer is we're looking for you guys to step up, much as John did when everybody was pretty smug about the state of, of mobile security, shock the hell out of us and produce a giant solution to a giant problem that nobody was thinking about. And also, I'd, I'd really like to not pay for your next vacation in the process. <laughs> I so, turned off my Bluetooth. Yeah, well, I remember to turn off mine about an hour ago. <laughs> so let me, let me ask the opposite question. So, you know, the, you meet lots of people working on super interesting projects, many of which, you know, can be intellectually interesting, but many times uh, won't end up being a business of the scale that we've talked about, billions of dollars. It doesn't mean it's not interesting. When does it make sense not to raise venture capital from someone like yourselves? Like, well, you know, there's, how do you think about the difference between the types of things you would want to actually fund and the types of things that someone might want to go turn into a business, but it doesn't make sense to talk to people like you guys. Are we pushing or popping the stack, John? We're pushing this time. It's you. <laughs> uh, I'll, 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 try to be, I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, there's a concept in finance called net present value. How many of you guys are familiar with that? Awesome. That's in disturbingly well-educated hacker crowd. Um, so um, the, the dirty secret uh, or the other dirty secret of venture capital is that your NPV utility curve and the VC's NPV utility curve can diverge pretty rapidly. So thanks to a feature of um, preferred stock investment, most VCs get the right to keep investing in your company every time you take money, which means as long as we have deep enough pockets, our stake doesn't go down and it may in fact go up a little bit. Your slice of the pie, as more new dollars pour in, is in effect reduced over time as you continue to build a company. So if you build a really giant company and you and your founding team own 10% uh, and you sell it for a billion dollars after 10 years, that's 100 million bucks. That seems like a pretty good outcome. But if you own 80% of your company and you sell it for $100 million two years into it, that's $80 million. Uh, so you would have had a better NPV selling earlier uh, uh, than later for a, a, a supposedly more impressive uh, number. And when you factor in risk, building billion dollar outcomes is really freaking hard. Um, you're definitely better off selling for 80 million bucks in, in two years. Now, 
that's also good. That magic outcome is hard to do, and I'm, I'm picking deliberately simplistic examples. But when you are pretty sure that you have a point solution, I think as John referred to, that solves a really difficult problem that's a quote unquote awesome family business, makes 10 or 15 million dollars a year with great cash flow for you and, and, and your friends, um, that's probably not a business that you want to take venture capital for. There's no reason for you guys to dilute yourselves. If you need money, take angel money, keep 80% of your equity, and you know, when, uh, when one of the big bruisers uh, panics and realizes they need this point solution and pays you 100 million bucks, laugh all the way to the bank. If you are doing one of these global platforms that John and Ping uh, alluded to, um, the kind of thing I alluded to, uh, like replacing all of RSA, then you probably need venture capital. You probably need people who have been through it before, whether they're CEOs like John uh, or other former operating guys like Ping, to help you build that gigantic business. So uh, that's, that's kind of how I see the world. You know, I'll give two examples um, to kind of put a finer point to what Matt's saying. There, the answer isn't always venture capital. Um, you know, we are currently investors in a company called Tenable, which is uh, the guys that created Nessus. And that company was bootstrapped by the founders for I think five, six years before we even put any money into the company. And it was profitable, growing very rapidly. Nessus is a very popular vulnerability scanning tool. And they didn't need the money because it was, the business could fund itself. And they didn't need someone like myself because they knew they didn't need those resources in the network to grow their business. It was growing very fine. And in the last uh, year or so, they decided they saw a larger opportunity around going global, about attacking, uh, extending the product line where they need additional capital. More importantly, they, need, they needed a partner that knew and had experience in expanding the business in ways they haven't expanded before. So the decision to make and take venture capital was less about the money, since the business is profitable, but more about the expertise and value add a partner can bring. Um, in the case of John uh, Herring's Lookout, it was very different, right? Obviously, from the very beginning, they were going after an exploding market in the mobile mobile security space, where speed to market, time to market, and you know, getting out ahead of, of the mobile platform, which is getting innovated by Google and Apple was, you know, was a precondition they just had to deal with from day one, right? So where venture capital was needed to accelerate the business and also helping scale a team and, and do all the other things around company building was needed day one, right? So I think it all really depends and I don't believe for the majority of the businesses out there that you require venture capital. Um, I think it's something that you should look at deeply before you take money because as Matt says, once you uh, take money from another partner, it's, it's, it's a partnership and it's not a sole proprietorship anymore. And that's, that's a very big transition. Um, so I think it, it really depends on the opportunity and what you want to do. And I, if I could jump in, I think uh, Ping makes a great point that um, sometimes there's a perception that what venture capital is is mm -hmm. you get money and then the VC comes to your board meeting hoping you're doing well. And and that, we, we do do that though we do hope to do. <laughs> <laughs> that you you really do if in the early stages if you are uh, if you do decide to accept venture funding you really do need to look for a partner you really do need to look for a firm that 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 has people and services that will add value to to what you're trying to do I mean these firms you see up here are all firms that have done a lot in security. So obviously we all have resources that help you be successful. At, at Andreessen Horowitz, we have a thing called the Executive Briefing Center that John knows about that um, we bring in chief security officers and government officials and all sorts of people on a weekly basis and bring in our, our portfolio companies and they get to present to people even before they've released the product to test the market for their idea. Um, and as they mature, like John's company has, they get to talk to real buyers of the solution. Um, and that's a real big service that, uh, for example, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, we, we bring for our entrepreneurs. So, so to Ping's point, you really do want to pick a partner uh, that's often both the firm and the individual partner at the firm that's going to be uh, your chief liaison and, and help you grow the company. And, and actually, I, I, I want to chime in and amplify John's point. 
it's not just the firm. It's not brand. Um, uh, there's a company that John and I actually have in common uh, that's desired right now by a lot of people in the venture capital community. And they, they met with one of the very senior guys at one of the top ten firms in the world. Every Fortune, Forbes, article, you know, uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, TechCrunch, I mean, it would, however you want to view kind of external validation, uh, this firm had it and, and to some extent this guy had it as well. And he was such an arrogant dickhead in, in the meeting that the entrepreneur said, not only will this guy not be helpful, right, I mean, however giant a check he wants to write, but he'll be actively harmful. Um, and, and by contrast, um, and in credit to, to, to JJ, um, the entrepreneur said, look, what, what I want is um, somebody like JJ, who's an operating guy, who's done real stuff, who's been through good times and bad times, it can help me move a little further down the road. He basically said, I want another partner because I'm stuck in the boat with this person for 10 years. And, uh, uh, you know, Ping and his team are successful in this because they act like partners. And the entrepreneurs that we fund early on like both of these firms uh, because uh, they're, they're happy with them. We're still waiting for Deepak to start writing checks, so <laughs> it's a, a, a gentle nudge. We got a few for you, buddy. <laughs> so um, let me frame this, uh, this problem, right? The, the problem is this. As an entrepreneur, the odds of failure are far higher than the odds of success. That's history, that's data, you can read, read it anywhere. So every step you, do, uh, you take, every meeting you, you go to, everyone you talk to should be able to increase the odds of success. That's the fundamental underpinning here. So all the top venture firms I can say, largely speaking, are there to help you to increase the odds of success through introductions to top CISOs, uh, helping to find the right mentors for you. Finding a mentor is really, really important and never under, uh, underrate that, so I think most of the top VC firms can help you, uh, help you do that. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, when do you not take a uh, venture capital money to your question? If the business is low risk, for example, you know, one small check that we do is, okay, can a bank lend to this company for expanding their business? Definitely not, then it's not a VC investment. We look for really high risk investments that need to grow really fast. Banks look for low risk investments that don't grow that fast. So typically venture capital money is going to help you go from you know, zero to 10 million to 100 million in like three to four years. In that situation, no venture capital money is a good fit. So maybe I can share a quick story for those who might be interested in, in, and are thinking about starting companies. On the, on the flip side of all of this too is um, you can hear an infinite amount of no's, but you only need to hear yes once. And it's really important to keep that in mind. I remember vividly, you know, when we were first getting off the ground, we were doing obscure wireless research and, and a lot of mobile stuff. And there was not a lot of interest in what we were doing at first. You know, Ping wrote us a check and a few of our early angels did, but, but most of our investors that we pitched thought, did not understand what we were doing at all. And uh, it's, it's really easy to get depressed when, when you're running around trying to raise money and everyone's telling you you're basically an idiot. Um, but having the fortitude to, to, to continue on I think is one of the greatest lessons I've ever learned in raising venture capital. And it, 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 it never gets easier, you just get better. Um, and hopefully the market's on your side, but I vividly remember, I don't know if you, sometimes it takes, you know, the irrational being, like reasonable people will work on reasonable problems, but consensus accurate predictions never yield outsized results. Really important thing to understand. The outliers come from things that are not obvious and um, unreasonable people will work on unreasonable problems. Thus you probably need to be pretty unreasonable to do something amazing. And I, or this guy Vinod Kosla, for those who don't know who he is, is very, can be an unreasonable dude and he's very, very br brilliant. Uh, founded Sun Microsystems and I'll never forget we were pitching him and everyone had been telling us no and halfway through the meeting he's like, all right, I've heard enough. I'm like, shit, he's going to throw us out. Like, this is horrible. 
And he's like, I'm in. What's the valuation? And he literally wrote us a $5 million check that afternoon. And I've never experienced anything like that after <laughs> hearing no's for just like 50 no's and then something like that happens. And then not long after that, Excel got involved and the company really started to take off. And there's definitely a world where this company never would have even existed if we wouldn't have kept going, not because we were there to make money and not because we were there to build a business, because we love what we do. I mean, there's 140 people at, at DEF CON from Lookout. You know, we're a much bigger company now and it's, it's, it's who we are, like nothing's changed, even when we're a lot bigger and that, that's really exciting to me. So I think it's something really important to, to think about as everyone here starts businesses, is the foundations and passion and it's a lot about having the fortitude to keep going. So, so my question for, for, for this group is how do, you, how do you think about spotting the non-obvious investments? Like when you see deals that, that you're willing to make a non-obvious investment in, I'm, I'm curious, Peng, I know you've done a bunch of these, like what are the things that you look for in an entrepreneur when you're willing to make a bet that seems really out there? Yeah, I think the, the non, it's the, at least in the way we think about Excel, the, the venture guys don't come up with the ideas. We never confuse ourselves with the entrepreneurs. So what, what we look for is for the entrepreneurs to provide that inspiration. And it, it really is from going out and talking to as many entrepreneurs as you can. The reason why I'm at DEF CON isn't because I'm going to win, you know, any hack comp competition or anything like that. It's because I can spend time with what I think are really smart people that are thinking about things 10, 15 steps ahead of what I'm thinking about. And our job as venture guys is just to identify uh, those people that have those, those insights. So it's really in some ways uh, I always say like the best entrepreneurs are the ones that convince me that doing the impossible is actually possible. Because you know we sit there every day and we say hundreds of ideas and there's thousands of things wrong with every idea but there's always that one entrepreneur that comes through the door and for some reason every question you ask of him or her the answer comes back in such a way that you're like wow this guy may actually pull this off. And I'm like that is really actually possible what he just said. And no matter how you poke and prod at them, they've thought through every single angle of the problem. I can't tell you how, how thoughtful the entrepreneur are that we back in whatever space they're in. It could be big data, cloud, security, mobile. They've literally thought through every single possible permutation of the problem from the customer's angle, from the business model to every single angle. And it's really that that kind of gives us conviction. Not to say they have all the answers, but they've thought through all the problems and the questions. So that, that's kind of how we end up finding ourselves backing entrepreneurs, oftentimes in spaces that we did not have any idea or, or know anything about before we worked with that entrepreneur. I, I would actually uh, echo that. I, I joked earlier in the kids' presentation um, where we're trying to drive our investment uh, limit down to nine-year-olds. Uh, we're working hard on this. Um, There's no law against that. Actually. Yeah, there isn't. It's, it's not child labor as long as the LLC is in the dad or mom's name. Uh, so, so kid, kidding aside, what what I said there is, um, uh, I want entrepreneurs who will make me feel like a moron. And by uh, my wife would say that's actually not very hard, but <laughs> what. What I would say is, to Ping's point, you can be in a meeting with an entrepreneur, and, and I, I've watched this process uh, both at Excel and Andreessen Horowitz and, 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 and in my own career and deals we have in common. The entre you think you're being very clever, you know the uh, you know the uh, the entrepreneur. You know, I'll, I'll pick a fairly abstruse uh, example. The entrepreneur is doing something that, for some reason, involves zero knowledge proofs. Um, maybe it's a hobby of yours. Maybe you read a couple of the Scientific American articles about it or an I IEEE Spectrum or ACM proceedings uh, thing in Majiggy, and you, th you think you're actually, you think you've actually caught this person out. And they're nine steps ahead of you. And by the way, everything else that you ask, you have the sense as the big baller VC that you're a child that this person is patiently explaining how the world really works. And that's when, I, I, you know, as empirical as we try to make VC, that's when you get the gut feeling, especially if the person is passionate and engaged and, and driven about what they're doing, that this is a human being that you can back. And that they have this combination of, as Ping said, all the answers, but, um, but the fire in the belly to, to go through with it. And, you know, 
John, you, you come across as a fairly quiet guy, but um, clearly you had the fire in the belly as well as all the answers when, uh, when Vinod stopped you halfway through. Um, I have one more thing is we're wrong all the freaking time. So to John's earlier point or his earlier story, you can't look at a VC saying no uh, as a valid condemnation of your dream or objective or, or, or goals. You have to look at it as a fallible human being or group of human beings with incomplete data making the best literal guess that they can. And, and by the way, no's are good. I mean, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is no matter how crazy the idea, we will write a couple of paragraphs that explain in detail our decision making for the no. We never send an email saying, yeah, it's just not a fit. All right, check you later. Um, we say, hey, look, you know, you had this product flaw and we talked of the four customers you asked us to and they were lukewarm and, you know, you have 17 competitors, you only listed four, the market may be more crowded than you think. Um, and a lot of the time we, we get a thank you instead of an F you uh, even when we say no because it's actually useful for the entrepreneur. This is the one conference you can actually say fuck on stage. Yeah, yeah okay. So you can, <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. I've yeah, doing a lot exactly. of panels the so, first time I could, first time I could say fuck yeah, on, a, on a panel. I just wanted to get that out. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess Ping's luckier uh, because uh, I, I've had entrepreneurs on occasion invent entirely new mathematical symbologies to tell me how bad they wanted me to fuck myself. Um, <laughs> but but John, John's absolutely right. You can't, you can't take a no as definitive and, and, and I think when you do get a no, the one piece of feedback that I have for everybody in this room is demand, demand the reasoning behind it and use it to go strengthen your pitch. So, and go see go see Vinod. Apparently, he writes five million dollar checks in less than thirty minutes. <laughs> so, so, um, so I think we've got about ten minutes left. I want to make sure we have time for Q and A. So, there's there's two microphones right there for those who want to ask questions. We'll start over there. So, let's talk about the logistical process of how you get started. So, we've talked you've talked about it from a high, hypothetical, but w you know, at what point? are people interacting with you? Is it when they have a full-fledged product, like a prototype? I mean, obviously it's going to be different from hardware software, right? Hardware is going to have a lot more capital expenditures to begin with. But let's talk about some of the logistics of how they would interact with you to contact you guys. Well, the, um, so from my personal experience, not as a VC, but as someone who started a company, um, I, don't, I don't think you, I don't think you need to wait at all. I think you can start building relationships with VCs by, you know, you, you, you get introduced or you introduce yourself and you simply say, I have a concept I'd like to talk to you about. Most, most VCs, to, I think Ping said it earlier, want to talk to as many entrepreneurs as possible. And you can come in and say, I, I'm not ready to raise money yet, but I just want to test the waters with you with this kind of concept. And, and good VCs will not only, you know, test the waters with you, but they'll give you advice about, you know, you're thinking about this right, or but have you thought about what your co-founders would look like, or, um, you know, one thing we, that I tend to tell a lot of people is you can't just invent a product without thinking about how you're going to get that product into customers' hands early on. Like, you don't want to build this huge monolithic thing uh, I'll give you an example that requires an appliance and an agent on every endpoint. <laughs> you know, it's just not going to get sold. It may it may solve a problem, but it's no one buys technology now that requires something implemented on every endpoint. So yeah, you you don't need to wait. You can start the process right away, and don't be afraid that oh shit, I didn't have a grip. This is the place you can swear, right? Um, I, I, I didn't have a great meeting, so now I, I screwed my relationship with that particular VC. Not at all. If, if you did, then that VC is not the right VC anyway. Thank you. On the left? Yeah. So, hello? Okay. So here, here it is. You talk about the impossibility. So I'm from New Jersey. You've ever heard the expression waste management? Yep. You know, guys from New Jersey, New York, what business are you in waste management? So I'm in the business of, of eliminating and killing and crushing 
foreign adversary for child pornography. Now that's an impossible attempt to go against foreign adversaries, organized crime figures, people who actually don't want to actually step up to the plate. So I'm in the waste removal business. Something that nobody can say no to because if you say no, you're saying no to helping kids. Well, I challenge a panel right here, right now. I got the technology, I got streaming data, I got security, I got everything you could possibly imagine to get these people off the streets. The Russians are making $8 billion a year just in child pornography alone and they're selling it through cybersecurity and other areas under the radar. So what do you guys think about addressing an issue that actually collectively helps save the youth of the nation that people say it's impossible to do? Who says it's impossible? Everybody says it's impossible to address issues because nobody wants to address the issue because of the ugliness of the intellectual property and the issue that goes along with it. Nobody wants to stare at 80 million kids being raped. You, you gotta In get video out. alone, nobody wants to go through the process, filter it, decipher it, and then put it in the right position and then remove it and then try to figure out how to get it out of the hands of people who then would actually not want to have it or have creep up on them, whether it be social media. So, or so, so two comments. One, um, it is sunnier in California. I, I think we got a better attitude about the impossible than maybe in Secaucus. So, so come visit. Right. Um, the second thing is, uh, I can't speak to my fellow panelists. I know some of them had tight schedules, um, but I will come find you and I will listen for ten minutes to your impossible idea, and I will give you the best advice that I can. Any other, any other opinion on the panel? I'll, I'll be, I'll be outside right afterwards. Is it just you or nobody else has any comments? I, I have no idea what my colleagues can do, but I, I will step up. Great. Over here on the right? Got it. Yes. I Hello? I, I'm an internet uh, veteran from you know, decades back, and I'm, I, my question is, when are ideas too big for you guys to be interested in? I, I heard earlier on you talked about CypherCloud, something like that. Well, I come from maybe a slightly diff alternate universe from this crowd, from, from the standards field, and, and there's this gone through this multiple times in the past, but currently there's something called DNSSEC, could be a platform for a whole bunch of security, solving a lot of problems, maybe eating some security vendors lunch as well. Uh, and I've heard when I'm looking for interest from investors, just to not, not to make money myself, but to make this stuff happen, I, I, I get, well, you know, Rick, that's a, that's, a, that's, a bit, that's a big play. That's too big. That's too rich. And so, you, you know, you were talking about looking for the, I mean, I understand maybe it's one out of ten, then you're doing really good if you're successful. So I understand risk is not something you're afraid of, but I'd like to get maybe a, a one sentence, short little response about uh, w when is something not appealing at all to you guys? That's just too big. Thanks. Well, um, I, I couldn't hear everything, but just in your question about when is something too big? Uh, there, there really isn't anything too big. And, and when you have a, when, you, when you're in the venture capital business, we're about finding big opportunities. I think the thing that I would think about um, with your particular opportunity is to actually break the problem down into smaller pieces. Don't try to solve the end state um, right from the beginning. I think a lot of entrepreneurs see the end state, but the market or the, the industry is, is may not be as far along as where you want it to be. So one of the one of the failure modes we've seen in a lot of companies is being too early to a market um, and just making sure that you line yourselves up with market realities and will play out over time. And sometimes things take longer or they take a path that's slightly different. So the end state is usually bigger than what anyone imagines, but how you get there sometimes is is very different. And I think a lot of people try to do the big thing first. Um, and so be patient, I guess. Great, thanks. Over here. So I'm one of these people that has an idea. I'm not ready to come to venture capital yet. And because what I'm working on is two-factor authentication, behavior and bio in one fell swoop, I'm going to need to put an endpoint on every, you know, an, an appliance on every endpoint. Unfortunately, that's just the nature of the beast. How do I, and I, it, it requires software and hardware. The hardware has been invented but not in the right size. And the software, somebody could, pro, could program it that's not me. How do I get it to a point where I can bring it to somebody to get some money so I can hire someone to build the hardware the size I need it and do the programming because I don't have the money? How do I get it to a point where I can get some help? You can come today and then we can talk about it. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure the, uh, to, to an earlier point here, it's okay to go to VCs before you are ready, before the product is in the market. 
so that we can give you advice on what we have seen on how to bring these products to market. I'm assuming I need to have you sign an NDA? VCs don't do that. Yeah, we normally do not sign NDAs. So uh, m maybe, I can, maybe I can chime in here. Okay. Um, two, a couple things. One, um, the only purpose of an NDA uh, uh, that you can, you can argue for is in, actually in the first to file patent regime which would be to protect, uh, protect you from future claims by somebody that you'd exposed your information in public and therefore you couldn't patent it. As it turns out, if you're talking to somebody about financing your company, there's an exemption in, in the law for that, that that applies internationally. So you're not jeopardizing your patents by, by talking to a VC under first to file. And VCs can't sign NDAs because all it takes is a small handful of surly people filing nuisance lawsuits and not our money but our time is then so consumed in, in that kind of litigious regime that VCs would just stop investing in promising young companies. So literally to, you know, to protect, uh, to achieve herd immunity, <laughs> uh, not signing NDAs is a form of vaccination. As far as what you want to do, even if it's not the right thing for a VC, there's Kickstarter and a whole bunch of other crowdfunding stuff. There is AngelList. We know the guy is well there. We're actually investors in that platform. Um, that's, a, uh, that's an awesome way of getting like-minded people to back you. Um, and you know what? I, I don't know exactly what you're doing, but if you showed up and said, you know, uh, hey, I've got something that, uh, that plugs into a USB port or it works over low power Bluetooth, the next generation of laptops, um, and I can provide bulletproof, authenticatable security locked to an individual human being. Um, yeah. You know, maybe that's my sign-in for, um, you know, my, uh, my TrueCrypt. Um, I, I can unlock TrueCrypt with, with your gizmo. You're right with me. Keep yeah. going. There, there's half a million dollars of human beings interested in that on AngelList or Kickstarter without a huge amount of effort. So I say go for it. Matt, Matt's so, going to write you a $5 million check right now. <laughs> Congratulations. So, uh, you need another 30 minutes before I write you the $5 million. So, so I'll make the time. I'll make the time. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I know the, the panelists will probably be up here after for questions, so anyone who does have questions, just come on up and uh, grab the panelists after. Let's thank everybody. Appreciate it.